So, since the Surf and Storm update, underwater combat has become a quote-unquote theatre of war that actually has a point behind it. Objectives are now submerged below the waves, and if you find yourself battling around these objectives, you need the right weaponry to get the job done. This is where the amphibious weapons come into play. G'day there once again viewers, your mate Kamikaze78 here, and today we're going to be doing a deep dive into the amphibious weapon category so you know which weapons are best for you. So I've been thinking about how we're going to address the UBR-100 Frogman, the UBR-150 Sea Lion, and the UBR-300 Swordfish for a while now. You know, do we review each of them individually? Do we do a bulk round? Was it even worth reviewing them in the first place? Well, after some deliberation, and after the Surf and Storm patch actually making them, well, relevant, I settled on doing a big old bulk video for all of them. We're going to be discussing the stats of each of these weapons, discuss their uses, their limitations, and identify which of them is best for the playstyle of your choice. But beforehand here guys, if I can be 100% honest with you all, this is going to be a video that is very much a do as I say, not as I do kind of video. Because well, I think the first thing we need to do here is establish some expectations and also establish that all of these amphibious weapons, no matter which one we talk about, are simply not worth using on land when compared against their more traditional counterparts. Now that's not to say that if you like how the amphibious weapons feel on land or they just work for you that you should stop. You do you gang, I'm not here to dictate your life, but if we look at these weapons from a statistical capability perspective, they fall short against all other options in many ways, and we'll go over all of that a bit more later. But what you are going to see here in this video is no underwater footage. I'm a land-based creature in this video using amphibious weapons the whole way very much feeling like a fish out of water in a certain way. Long and short of it is, well, that I couldn't get any time on OSHA in underwater fights in the lead up to this video. So as we continue operating on the narrative that these weapons are a little left to be desired on land, I also recognize the irony that all footage in this video is above the waves. But anyways, as opposed to dwelling on the joys of lacking recording opportunities, let's start off by taking a look at each of these weapons statistically and seeing what we're working with here. We'll start off with the UBR-100 Frogman, which is, for all intents and purposes, the middle ground of the amphibious arsenal and sets the scene here for the rest of the weapons to come. Here, we have a 143 maximum damage until 5 meters, dropping off to 125 damage at the 60 meter range. Already, we're starting to see the shortcomings that are consistent across this entire class of weaponry, that being the ranges associated with the damage drop-off. A 5 meter maximum damage range is really appalling here for any automatic weapon. Hell, most SMGs even are known to outrange these weapons in the maximum damage distance category. To make it clear, that means that you can only score a 7 shot kill within 5 meters, which means that yeah, beyond barrel stuffing your opponent, your weapon is going to feel a little bit more sluggish to use. And when we throw in the 650 52 rounds per minute fire rate, or the 10.86 rounds per second, things don't get any better for the lethality of these weapons here either. This combination of fire rate and damage model is exactly the same damage model you would find on weapons that put all of their eggs in the accuracy or sustained fire basket at the cost of raw firepower. It's the exact damage model that put the T-16 Rhino and the T-32 Bull in the E tier on our LMG tier list we ran a while ago. And while that damage model has admittedly some limited justification on larger capacity LMGs, it doesn't do that many wonders for a 28 round mag assault rifle that has to reload after, you know, a very short amount of time of firing. The effective time to kill here is 0.56 seconds within 5 meters and 0.65 seconds at the 60 meter range, which I get doesn't sound that bad on paper, but when you consider that the top echelon of weapons in this game, the key performers, the meta weapons if you will, perform at around a 0.47 to 0.5 second benchmark for time to kill, and then we start factoring in player accuracy and missing rounds, and the ballooning of the effective time to kill of these weapons, including the UBR-100 Frogman, starts to become a bit more apparent and a bit more unpleasant to use. 
Now, thankfully, there is a trade-off here, and it comes in the form of an incredibly easy to control recoil pattern. As you can see here, the vertical kick for the weapon is pretty light, with a small amount of horizontal deviation per shot. There is also no set horizontal angle here, meaning that the weapon is going to be operating on the axis of firing straight up, and the horizontal kick per shot seems to only be able to kick twice in one direction before being forced back towards the center point. So basically, pulling down on the mouse here is how you're going to keep this weapon on target. The Chrono Fire Bloom here is also nothing really special, basically sitting on par with all other weaponry classes in the world, but at least we get some pretty speedy reloads, which makes things at least a little bit nicer, I guess. But yeah, there's really no denying here, guys, that on the surface, both literally and figuratively, there's nothing much special about the UBR 100 Frogman. It's very clear that the Frogman, and as we'll soon see, the other weapons in the category, sacrifice a lot for the pleasure of having the extended effective range in underwater combat, which is obviously the entire point of these weapons. I'm not arguing that here, but outside of that water combat, you have the NS-11C, and NS-11A, which sport identical damage models with better damage ranges, muzzle velocities, reload times, it just makes more sense to run these weapons instead. And when you are either below the water or above the water, and just feel like challenging yourself, that's exactly how the Frogman plays like a worse version of these two aforementioned weapons. Which means that if you do want to use the UBR 100 Frogman, you essentially have to do the same thing as you would with an NS-11C or A, but do it all a tad slower, if you will. If we turn our attention to the other two weapons here, we'll see very similar trade-offs being made for the amphibious trait, with each weapon having just slightly different approaches to the underwater combat side of things. Starting off with the UBR 150C line, we see here that this weapon sports a 160 Seven maximum damage model here at a decreased fire rate of 550 rounds per minute or 9.16 rounds per second. And once again, would you look at that? We're in the region of a similar time to kill, 0.55 seconds to 0.66 seconds respectively. Coming with that heavier hitting round as well, we can also see a bit of a bump in the recoil, so be prepared to deal with that too. In saying that though, and this is a unique situation here where the sea lion actually has something unique kind of going for it here. It has a cone of fire bloom of only 0.1 per shot when moving or 0.05 when still. That's something you don't ever really see on a 167 damage model weapon. So there's a little something here, a little nugget of good, if you will, going for this weapon. And it's a little bit more accurate over longer bursts against other 167 damage model weapons you may be familiar with. It's basically great for anyone who plays the new conglomerate normally and prefers to stick with that damage model as such, but do it underwater instead. Now, changing tune a little bit here, and we find ourselves at the UBR 300 Swordfish, which is a weapon you can actually get for free using the Surf 2022 redeemable code in the depot. And we move to the polar opposite here, cranking the rate of fire all the way up at the cost of damage per hit. This time around, we're looking at a 125 maximum damage profile with a corresponding 698 rounds per minute fire rate and, oh my word, that time to kill. 0.61 seconds for the best case scenario and 0.78 seconds for the worst case scenario because this is the only amphibious weapon that drops two damage payload tiers over its damage range. Of all the amphibious weapons here, this is the weapon that sports the weakest effective payload, and noting that, you should really be taking every step you can to score headshots to make up for that lacking damage. However, we can also see that this weapon doesn't get anything in the way of leeway in the form of Cone of Fire, as other weapons with similar damage models also sport improved Cone of Fire Bloom stats to make up for that increased rate of fire and lacking damage payload. That's not the case here. Yet yeah, the Swordfish really leaves even more to be desired outside of water combat. And the problem with the Swordfish being a more CQC oriented weapon is that your non-amphibious weapons out there become effective in that range again, even in underwater fights. So the effective use of the Swordfish is kind of cancelled out by its mediocrity due to the fact that it's intended to be put in a CQC environment. And because of that intent, it immediately puts itself in battles with other weapons that inherently have much better damage payloads, but well, actually are in effective ranges even in those underwater battles where the swordfish is meant to rise and conquer, essentially. The long and short of it here, guys, is that these weapons all take on board a very passive damage payload. These aren't the weapons that you'll find yourself getting out and barrel stuffing people with and having much success. They just don't sport the capabilities that are required for that kind of playstyle. And yeah, sure, if you were to take advantage of the good accuracy to go for headshots, you can get around some of that. But it doesn't change the fact that even using the accuracy over DPS model, there are simply 
much better weapons out there that can get the job done a lot easier. Obviously in the underwater space the UBR 100 and 150 have their uses because they're able to reach out at range. But even the UBR 300 struggles underwater here as well thanks to its CQC design which inherently places it against just better performing weapons in that CQC space. And well, outside of the water, all three of these weapons simply have such a low skill ceiling that you're gonna outgrow them incredibly quickly. And quite frankly, these are weapons that I will never pick up again in those fights above water, which is 99% of this game. So as a result, and as a conclusion to this video, should you be buying the underwater weapons? And if so, which one should you be getting? Out of the gate here, I think we can rule out the UBR 300. For one, you can get it for free anyway, so there's no reason to ever buy the sucker. But two, it's also the worst performing out of the bunch. And well, I just think its entire purpose is a little, mm, out of place in the grand scheme of things. As far as the UBR 100 and 150 are concerned, look, they're both serviceable weapons in the underwater field, but at the end of the day, underwater fights in this game are still pretty rare, especially on the Connery server where I play. Whenever I am playing on OSHA, I see a sustained underwater fight take place very rarely, so I don't need these weapons in my inventory half the time. And to then go ahead and spend a thousand certs on a weapon that you're only going to use 1% of the time you're in-game doesn't make that much sense. So at the end of the day, I would recommend saving your certs, only buying one of these two weapons, depending on which one works best for you, and also buying it a little bit later in your playtime. As I said before, underwater battles, they don't seem to happen that often, so buying not one but two of these weapons is just not a good investment of your certs because you're going to see a very limited return on that. If you're someone who likes the heavy hitting damage payload of certain weapons, then the 150 is probably going to be the way to go, but if you're someone who prefers the more middle of the road, easy to just pick up and use and adapt to majority of situations out there, the 100 will get you there and it will get you there nicely in those underwater fights. But anyway, I know that a lot of people have been wanting me to share my thoughts on the underwater weapons so far, so I hope this answered some questions for you all. If it did, be sure to backhand the like button, it goes a long way to supporting the channel. And if you didn't enjoy the video, well, that dislike button still works as well. And also make sure you hit the subscribe button to stay up to date with whenever we do videos or go live right here on YouTube in the future. If you're watching this video before the 28th of August, we are currently running a charity campaign for the Starlight Children's Foundation of Australia, where we are raising funds to help improve the lives of sick kids who are here in hospital in Australia. If you want to support the campaign, I'd be greatly appreciative of that, and you can find the link down below in the description to learn more and to donate if you choose to do so. But once again, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. Peace out, and I will see you guys all in the next one. Take care, guys. Have a good one.